Almost everyone can agree on the events that unfolded at Chernobyl. It is an established fact that at 1.23.39, the AZ-5 button was pressed, and the control rods began to descend into the reactor. The graphite displacers attached to the bottom of the control rods displaced water in the lower 1.25 metres of the reactor, causing a sudden and dramatic increase in power at the bottom of the core. What nobody can agree on is what happened after 1.23.44 a.m. Some form of explosion tore the building apart, but the nature of the explosion remains unknown. Countless theories have been suggested. These are just a few of them. This time, we are going to take a look at one of the most popular theories in the general public about what happened at Chernobyl. The idea that a hydrogen explosion occurred in the reactor, tearing the building apart. Various origins for the hydrogen have been proposed, and this was the version of the explosion used in the HBO miniseries. However, there are massive problems with this theory, to the point it might in fact be impossible. Therefore, today we are going to look at the hydrogen explosion and explore why it doesn't work, and hopefully this might also teach you some physics and chemistry lessons along the way. First, a breakdown for those who aren't aware of the claimed hydrogen explosion. The events in the reactor play out similarly to how they have been described in other videos, with a build-up in pressure in the reactor due to the increased rate of fission, until it greatly exceeds the maximum force the reactor can withstand and the upper biological shield is thrown upwards and to the side in the first explosion. It is then understood that a second explosion occurred which is the one that tore the building apart. The difference between this and the steam explosion mentioned in the previous video is that this theory claims some sort of chemical reaction occurred in the reactor, resulting in the production of hydrogen, which then ignited and caused the explosion that tore the building apart. Many ideas have been put forward for the origin source of the hydrogen, ranging from a reaction involving the zirconium in the alloy that formed the fuel cladding, a reaction that involved the graphite blocks that made up the reactor, or the steam that was surging through it. Now, as I mentioned, this theory is by far the most popular, with most people accepting the claim that it was a mixture of oxygen, steam, and superheated graphite in the reactor. But a close examination of this theory will show that this is impossible. To understand why, we're going to break away from Chernobyl, and this time think about infectious diseases. For those who aren't aware, patients in hospitals suffering from very dangerous infections are kept in isolation rooms at a lower pressure than the world outside. This means that, for example, if the door to the room was opened, the air can only be sucked into the isolation chamber, stopping any airborne pathogens from escaping the room and into the rest of the hospital. The same thing applies to laboratories where they study these same diseases, keeping the room at a lower pressure so air can only flow in one direction. The reason why I bring this up is to establish that when one region has a higher pressure than the other, air can only flow in one direction, to the lower pressure. Given that, for several seconds after the first explosion that lifted Yelena off the top of the reactor, the pressure would be much higher due to the steam that had built up and continue to be as more water flashed into steam at the bottom of the reactor upon entry, it'd be impossible for any oxygen to enter the reactor and cause the explosion. It's slightly more than a massive hole in the theory. And, given that any hydrogen that escaped the reactor would instantly ignite at that temperature, you would not have a sudden large explosion, but a large flame that would shoot out of the reactor for several seconds. In other words, it wouldn't have destroyed the building like we see today. But let's ignore this fact, and look at the three main theories of the explosion. First, and the easiest to debunk, is the zirconium reaction theory. This theory claims that, when the temperature reached above 1200 degrees, the steam reacted with the zirconium in the fuel cladding to form hydrogen, which then reacted with oxygen to cause the explosion. Now, 
there's a huge problem with this. The explosion that destroyed Chernobyl had a force equal to somewhere between 10 and 225 tons of TNT. Yes, the range is that big. Using some conversions, this means you would need between 176 and 4,000 kilograms of hydrogen to produce the equivalent sized explosion, likely on the higher side. The one problem with this is that this means we should find plenty of zirconium dioxide lying around that was produced during the reaction. And yet, no zirconium dioxide has ever been found. Not in the reactor hall, not in the lava underneath the reactor like the elephant's foot, nor outside the building. Although we have found unreacted zirconium, the zirconium was not the source of the hydrogen. How about the graphite? The claim is that the steam from the reactor reacted with the graphite blocks to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen, which then ignited, as shown in HBO. Well, let's consult some experts and do some maths. In the scientific paper, experiments on high temperature graphite and steam reactions under loss of coolant accident conditions, which is specifically focused on graphite, this time being used in fusion reactors, we are shown that the rate of reaction between graphite and steam at temperatures around 1500 degrees Celsius is approximately 0.01 kilograms per square meter per second. The cross-sectional area of an RBMK is about 109.35 square meters, so assuming a rate of 0.01 kilograms of graphite reacting per square meter per second for three seconds, the maximum possible time between Yelena being thrown off and the explosion that destroyed the building, we produce 3.2 kilograms of hydrogen. Even if we assume the reaction is occurring 10 times faster than this, that is still only 32 kilograms of hydrogen. That's not even close enough to the smallest possible amount of TNT equivalent required for the explosion. And finally, the steam reaction. There are some who have made the claim that the very water inside the reactor itself could have separated, the hydrogen and the water atoms dissociating in the few seconds leading up to the explosion and then recombining at once, in a similar way to how a reaction appears to occur instantaneously in an iodine clock reaction. And it makes sense. At around 2500 degrees Celsius, water will begin to separate. Perhaps, with enough steam in the reactor, we will get enough hydrogen. However, yet again, there's a huge problem with this. And this time it's because I lied to you. According to Production of Hydrogen by Direct Thermal Decomposition of Water, Preliminary Investigations, we read that this is only true at one-tenth of atmospheric pressure. Think of this like a reversible reaction in chemistry, with water either dissociating to form hydrogen and oxygen, or the hydrogen and oxygen combining to form water. As the dissociation of water is endothermic, an increase in temperature will favour the forward reaction, splitting the water apart. However, an increase in pressure will favour the reverse reaction, as the equilibrium will favour the side with the fewer molecules that being just water. At one atmospheric pressure, the temperature required jumps to 3,300 degrees, and at 10 atmospheres, the pressure rises to 4,500 degrees Celsius. It's exponentially increasing, and an RBMK operates at a pressure of 6.9 megapascals, or about 68 atmospheres. Temperatures would need to be in the tens of thousands of degrees Celsius under normal operation. And, in the last seconds of Unit 4's life, pressure and temperatures had been estimated at almost 3,000 atmospheres, but only a maximum of 10,000 degrees Celsius, far too low for water to even begin dissociating in a small amount. It's just impossible. So, to conclude, with our current understanding of science, there is no way for hydrogen to be produced or ignite itself in an explosion like that at Chernobyl. There is no physical trace of a reaction, nor the conditions necessary for it to take place. What instead occurred 
was likely more violent and powerful than many people imagine. At the same time, I also want to thank you all for staying around, and I also hope that you learned something new today, whether you're interested in history, physics, or chemistry. A lot of this stuff involves things I learned about in high school, so if you're around that age and interested in my videos, hopefully you can apply this knowledge in school.